Georgia. I'm Bethany. And we are here today to bring you the children's story. So let us start with a word of prayer. Let's close our eyes and fold our hands. Dear Jesus, thank you for today. Please help us and protect us. Please help us understand the lesson today. Amen. 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 Thank you, Georgia. That was beautiful. We are now going to do two Bible verses, which will be brought to you by Georgia and Bethany. We'll start with Bethany. I'm reading from the book of Psalms, chapter 23, verse 1, 2, and 3. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He guides me along right paths. Bring honor to his name. Well done, Bethany. Georgia, your verse? It comes from Proverbs 3, verse 5. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Thank you, girls. That was beautiful. Today, our story comes uh, from a mission clip, which is a very beautiful story put together. We are going to meet a little girl named Neska, which is going to teach us a very good lesson about trusting in God and praying. Enjoy. Enjoy it. Little Agnieszka grew up in beautiful countryside in southern Poland. A big green forest stood on one side of her house. A green meadow with pretty white daisies and pink and purple wildflowers stretched out on the other side of the house. Agnieszka loved nature, but she was easily frightened. She didn't like the dark. Strangers were scary. Her family had cats, dogs, and chickens, but she was scared of them. She was especially terrified of mooing cows and gobbly gobbling turkeys. Fortunately, no cows or turkeys lived at her house. But a flock of turkeys did live in the yard of a farmhouse that she passed on the way to school. Agnieszka loved school and she loved walking to school. One morning, she skipped along the road to the village and turned the corner to school. A few steps later, she saw something that filled her with horror. She stopped in her tracks. Dozens of gobbly gobbling turkeys were wandering on the road. The birds were enormous and they made a loud, scary racket. <laughs> Agnieszka looked to one side of the road, a rushing stream. She couldn't walk through it. She looked to the other side. More gobbly gobbling turkeys were walking in a ditch and strolling in the adjacent meadow. She couldn't walk there. She looked beyond the meadow. The gate to the farmhouse fence was open and the yard was empty. The turkeys had escaped from there. Agnieszka was trapped. She couldn't go to school because of the gobbly gobbling turkeys. She couldn't go home because then she would be late for school. She sat down on the road to hide from the turkeys. God, help me, she prayed. Opening her eyes, she saw an elderly man riding a bicycle toward her. The man wore dark gray clothes and a dark gray cap. His bicycle was dark gray. He was coming from the direction of the school. Fearlessly entering the flock of gobbly gobbling turkeys, he energetically waved his arms and shouted, shoo, shoo. The turkeys gobbled even more and made a frantic dash toward their yard. Feathers flew, and the screech of the gobbly gobbling turkeys was deafening. <laughs> Agnieszka was surprised that the stranger wasn't scared of the turkeys. She had never seen him before, but she wasn't afraid. He looked sort of familiar. As the old man rode past her, he said kindly, It's all right now. Agnieszka's mouth dropped open in amazement. She looked at the turkeys gobbly gobbling back in their yard. She looked back at the road to wave at the old man. He had disappeared. Agnieszka happily ran to school. She wasn't even late. The turkeys never invaded the road again. Agnieszka has always remembered God's answer to her frightened prayer. Now the mother of two children, she tells them how the stranger scared away the turkeys. I don't know whether he was an ordinary man or an angel she says, but I know the victory came from God. I was able to survive the turkeys with God's help. Hope you enjoyed the story. Remember, God loves you. God takes care of you. God keeps you safe. Let's pray. Let's fold our hands and close our eyes. Dear Jesus, please guide us while we're in this lockdown and please 
keep let us keep the holy name and please love us and protect us in your name amen amen, amen. bye, bye. Um, Happy Sabbath Church, I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, my name is Tendelani Edwa and I will be doing our offertory reading for today. But before we read our verse for today, let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our kind and gracious loving Father, at this point in time, dear Lord, as we are about to hear your words speak to us, we pray that you may know, pray Holy Spirit upon us and that we may be able to hear you speak to us through your word. We humbly pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, and our verse for our offertory reading is found in the book of Genesis chapter 8. And we will start reading from verse 15. And we will stop in verse 20. And it reads as follows. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons, and thy son's wife with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is within thee, of all flesh, both of fowl and cattle, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his son's wife with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth. And after their kind went forth out of the ark. Verse 20. And Noah built an ark unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered a burnt offering on the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. So now, here it is after uh, the flood. After the days of the flood and when the earth was clear of water. Now God comes and commands Noah to get out of the ark. Him, his sons and their wives. And all the animals that were in the ark with Noah. That was the command from God that they must now come out of the ark. But I like what Noah does when he leaves the ark. The first thing that Noah did when he left the ark, we read in verse 20. And the Bible says in verse 20, Noah built an ark for the Lord. That was the first thing that he did. He built an ark for the Lord. And when he had built that ark, he offered sacrifices unto the Lord. And Ellen White in the book, um, Patriots and Prophets, she, 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 she explains uh, this act that Noah uh, did very profoundly. And she says, At last an angel descended from heaven, opened the massive door, and bade the patriarch and his household go forth upon the earth and take with them every living thing. In the joy of their release, Noah did not forget him whose gracious care they had been preserved. His first act after leaving the ark was to build an altar and offer from every kind of clean beast and fowl a sacrifice, thus manifesting his gratitude to God for deliverance and his faith in Christ, the great sacrifice. This offering was pleasing to the Lord, and a blessing resulted not only to the patriarch and his family, but to all who
who should live upon the earth. And then after that, Ellen White explains the lesson from the act uh, that Noah has done. And she says, here was a lesson for all succeeding generations. Noah had come forth upon the desolate earth, but before preparing a house for himself, he built an altar to God. His stock of cattle was small and had been preserved at great expense, yet he cheerfully gave a part to the Lord as an acknowledgement that all was his. In like manner, it should be our first care to render our free will offerings to God. May the good Lord bless the reading of his word uh, in Jesus' name. And I pray that uh, at home with our families, we may learn a lesson from the act of Noah. Even though the supply that he had was so small, but his, his cheerfulness and gratitude towards what God has done for him did not um, or encourage him to offer uh, sacrifices to the Lord. And I believe that within our families, uh, during this time of COVID-19, the Lord has preserved us and he has kept us. And I would like us all uh, to encourage us all that let us offer offerings of gratitude to the Lord. And let us not forget as well to return our tithes uh, to God. May the good Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. And let us bow uh, our heads in a word of prayer. Our kind and gracious loving Father, we thank you, we thank you, dear Lord, for yet allowing us another opportunity to give unto you, Gosi, uh, uh, our offerings and, and the tithes goes from everything that you have done for us and for everything, dear Lord, that you have given us. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that each and every family at this hour, dear Lord, as they will they have given unto you, dear Lord, from the supply that you have given them as a, 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 an, an offering of gratitude, an offering of thanksgiving, dear Lord, for, for keeping us alive and keeping us safe during this difficult time. We thank you, dear Lord, and we pray that, dear Heavenly Father, you may continue blessing us and may you, you may continue protecting us and keeping us safe during this difficult time. This is our humble prayer in the most wonderful name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I take this opportunity to greet and to welcome you all to Port Elizabeth II District in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome to our divine service. Now, before I may introduce our speaker for today, I want to thank the district ambassadors together with the NMU dozen members who yesterday uh, at Friday night Vespers took their time to speak out against the violence that has plagued our beloved country. I also want in that same fashion, we want to thank Pastor Swartz for such a powerful poem she rendered yesterday, a poem that she penned in response to Pastor Bloss's sermon on unity last month when he was concluding our week in spiritual emphasis. And if you missed the program yesterday, be sure to go back and watch it. You might learn a thing or two, believe me you. I also want to acknowledge the Blunden daughters for their beautiful story they've just shared. The two girls are from uh, Kabika SDA Church. I also want to thank want to thank our Elder Yedwa from Stazin for yet another powerful reminder about our faithfulness to the Lord uh, through our tithes and offerings. I also want to thank First Light, our beloved friends from uh, Cape Town, for the two music items they are yet to render. May the Lord continue blessing your ministry, beloved, and may it grow from strength to strength. Lastly, 
I want to thank in advance Elder Edward from Kabika SDA for the Vespa service he will be doing later today at 17.30. I pray the Lord use you, my elder, like he has never done before. Today we are blessed to have in our midst uh, Pastor Otto. Now Pastor Otto is the Associate Pastor of of the Northern Suburbs District in the Western Cape of the Cape Conference. Men of God, thank you for allowing the Lord to use you to feed his flock. And on behalf of myself and Dr. Gwala, I want to say bless this family is watching you today. And for this, the Lord bless you too. Feed your flock. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. My name is Pastor Eric. I'm here to present another encouraging message from the Word of the Lord. And I would like to just start off with a, a word of prayer, shall we? Um, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we're about to delve into your Word, may your Holy Spirit just lead and guide our thoughts. And may we find encouragement from this message that you've prepared for us. Amen. All right, so the title of my message today is, I get knocked down, but I get up again. And it came from reading a powerful message by the Apostle Paul, found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 to 9. And it says, We were troubled on every hand, yet we were not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're cast down, but not destroyed. And it's this testimony of confidence that I want to unpack a little bit today. And we're going to be looking at four Greek terminologies or four Greek words to help uh, explain to us a little bit more about what Paul was going through in this particular verse. This past week, I was I told a story about a poor parakeet that was found in a precarious predicament when its owner decided to clean its cage with a vacuum cleaner. Now you must know this is something that you do not do if you own a bird. Do not vacuum the cage while the bird is still inside. Long story short, the lady answered her phone while she was vacuuming this poor cage and all of a sudden she heard thump. She vacuumed her poor parakeet into the vacuum cleaner. Freaked out, apparently, she opens up the vacuum cleaner, sees this little bird, picks it up. It's full of dust. You can't even recognize it. It's supposed to be a vibrant color and it's just in a mo mono color. It's gray. Um, it's like, a you know, maybe a, a 60s film, black and white type vibe. And it's, it's oh, shame. It's busy freaking out in her hands and she decides what's the best thing to do right now is to go and wash it. So she runs to the bathroom and opens up the cold water and rinses this bird in cold water. Not only is the bird wondering what just happened, but now I'm freezing cold. She decides, okay, not only have I cleaned it, but now I need to heat it up because the poor bird is busy shivering to death. She takes a hairdryer and she blasts this bird with a hairdryer. And you know, if you've used a hairdryer before, that thing can get hot. Anyway, long story short, this poor bird sat in its cage afterwards wondering what has just happened. You know, I can tell you still to this day, that bird sits there and not a song escapes from its beak because it's still traumatized. Anyway, I laughed so much at listening to the story, but you know, it reminded me a little bit about life as well, where sometimes we can get down and out. We're busy there, perked up at life. We're, we're singing our song, we're doing our thing and something unexpected happens and um, we're blown over. We are down and out. And it's this feeling of being down and out that I wanna unpack a little bit because Paul essentially says in this testimony of confidence of his in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse eight and nine, he says, you might be down, but you are not out. When it comes to God, when you are down, you are not out. 
And without, you know, subscribing to cliches, I always say when you're down on your knees through despair, that's the perfect time to pray. But even though you're going through troubles and trials in life, even though you're going through the hardest times in your life, you go through battles, you go through difficulties, you might be down, but you are surely not out. And that's the encouraging message that we find from uh, the Apostle Paul. And so scripture declares also in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, it says a righteous man might fall seven times, but he gets up again. So you might be down, but I can tell you this, most assuredly, you can get up again. And the Apostle Paul writes this passage, and when he writes to us, he's writing from the area of Macedonia. And as we know, in Paul's own words to the church at Corinth, that this has a season of great trials and difficulties in his life. This is not a time of, you know, ease for him. He is going through a tough, tough and terrible time. And so we pick up from this where it says, we came into Macedonia, we found no rest for ourselves, Paul says. No rest for ourselves whatsoever. There were all kinds of fights and commotions on the outside, and we had fears and turmoils on the inside. Doesn't that describe a little bit about how we feel today sometimes, where there is commotion on the outside, where there's uncertainty on the outside, but on the inside we have these fears, we have these turmoils that overcome us particularly. So what I want to do for our message today is just unpack four Greek words that um, Paul uses in this little pericope to help us just to understand the predicament that Paul was facing, but also the terminology that he used to describe his situation. And as we know, when we study Greek or biblical Greek, the use of a word um, is very important to the context that it's used, but also um, the meaning of a particular word in Greek is so much broader than any English variant that we can use. So it's always good to look at them. They are quite long, they are quite difficult, but I wanna to present to you four Greek words that Paul used to describe the environment that he's in. And uncannily, it also describes the environment we are in here in South Africa, at least during this lock time, during this time of uncertainty. So the the first um, Greek word that he uses is called phlebiminoi. All right, phlebiminoi means troubled, but it doesn't just mean troubled. It means that you are encompassed all around you. You are in a 360 degree kind of environment, per, uh, not perplexed, but you are covered with trouble. Trouble is pressurizing you. Uh, you cannot turn left, you cannot turn right. It's as if you are crowded in an environment of trouble. It reminds me of a time actually when I was in New York City, where we were in the subway at five o'clock in the afternoon trying to travel from one side of the city to the next we went into that subway and we were jam-packed like sardines it was the weirdest environment to be in you literally couldn't move left you couldn't move right that feeling of claustrophobia was right there and also the feeling of awkwardness when somebody else was staring at you right in the face not worried because this is their daily you know for a south african you know who doesn't really travel on a train uh, you're sitting there and you're like what is happening like i feel violated my personal space is not about me like come on what is this? But that's what Paul was trying to describe when he says that they were phlebiminoi, distressed. He had trouble, or rather that he, he had trouble, that phlebiminoi meaning trouble, that he was troubled from every single environment, whether he turned left or turned right, and it was claustrophobic for him. But it says that he was troubled but not distressed. And that is the second word that he uses in Greek. It's called steno koromenoi. All right, say it with me, steno koromenoi. Quite a long word, but that basically means that you're crowded in a narrow place so that you can't move left or right. So he's saying, even though I'm encompassed 360 degrees with trouble, I am not distressed. I'm not in an environment where I can't move left and I can't move right. I can move about freely. And the idea is that though he was close pressed by persecutions and trials, his trials did not wholly prevent his motion and action. He was still able to go from here to there to everywhere and do the work of the Lord. And so his distress, his uh, dist uh, rather his troubles that he was facing, his libiminoi didn't allow him to become stenokoromenoi, 
all right? His troubles didn't allow him to become distressed. The third Greek word that Paul uses in this little pericope is called a paromenoi, all right? A paromenoi means perplexed. And it means being without resource, not only to be without resource, but not knowing what to do, being very hesitant to go left or to go right, to be in doubt constantly, to be not only in doubt, but the anxiety that you receive when you don't know where to go or what to do can be described as um, yeah, trying to ask for directions, but no one being there to direct you on where to go. Matter of fact, um, my brother and I, we found ourselves traveling up the country a couple of years ago in a banged up Land Rover. It was battered and bruised. It had a family of mice in the, <laughs> in the roof. Literally, the lights didn't work. And at two o'clock in the morning, we were traveling down the road and our lights just, they just broke. And we didn't know where to go or what to do. And we had to shine our lights from our phones outside to see where we were going. We praise God that like two Ks down the road, there was a petrol station with somebody who could fix, somebody who was an auto electrician working on a diesel bucky. Long story short, we were saved from that predicament. But what we felt was a paromenoi, that anxiety about not knowing what to do, not having the resources and not knowing where to go. So Paul says, even though we were a paromenoi, we were, we were perplexed. We will not ex paromenoi. We were not in despair. Now this word ex paromenoi means that they were not left entirely without resources. Their needs were provided for. Their embarrassments per, per se were removed. Their grounds of perplexity were taken away. Not only that, but they found that they were in a, an environment of unexpected strength and resources. So even though they didn't know where to go or where to turn, they found that they had strength unexpectedly and their resources were imparted to them unexpectedly. So when they did not know what to do, when all their resources seemed to fail them in, un, in some unexpected manner, they were relieved and saved from their absolute despair. So these are those four words. If you are thlebiminoi, if you are troubled, you don't have to worry because you will never be stenokoromenoi, distressed, right? Even though Paul was troubled, he wasn't distressed. Even though Paul was a paromenoi, perplexed, he was not in ex paromenoi, in despair. And I can tell you this right now, sometimes we find ourselves in life in a predicament where we don't know what to do, we don't know who to turn to, we don't have the things that we need, we are struggling, we don't know what to do with our families, we don't know what to do with our friends, we don't know what to do with our finances, our marriages, our studies, and our struggles. And everything seems to be able to thlebiminoi, to surround us and give us great anxiety. But Paul says in this powerful verse, he says, we are troubled at every hand, but we are not distressed. We are not a stenokoromenoi, all right? Um, we might be perplexed. We might not know or have the knowledge of what to do right now, but we will never be in despair. And that's something that I find great encouragement with that if you hand your life over to God, he will give you that knowledge. He will attend to your every single need so that you don't have to be ex or a paromenoi or these different ways that, the, uh, that Paul was using during his pericope. But it's a powerful, powerful verse that says you might get knocked down, but you can get up again. You might be knocked down, but you're not knocked out. And so my hope and prayer is that you remember these four words. You remember this powerful pericope in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 to 9 that says, We are troubled at every hand, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. You see, God will attend to every need. He's promised that to you, and He will attend to your every need. Um, we find that, I find that in my personal life. Unexpectedly, when I have prayed, he has delivered, even when it is impossible. I can tell you, when you pray in the face of impossibility, it takes faith and trust to believe that God will deliver you from your environment. But I can tell you this, it's a testimony of confidence that Paul had and that I also share in my personal life. 
And so I hope that you can share in that same confidence, that same testimony, that same trust in God that he will attend to your every single need. So I don't know where you're at in your lockdown experience. If you're struggling with your finances, if you're struggling with job security, if you're struggling with your family, now that you're forced into an environment to spend more time with them, my hope and prayer is that you will pray and hand your life over to God so that he may ensure that he attends to your need. But not only that, direct your life in a powerful way. I preached a sermon not so long ago about using this time to grow. And this is a time of growth and a time for us to challenge ourselves, to get to know ourselves better, to get to know other people better, to get to know our families better. And we can only do that essentially if we're getting rid of distractions, getting rid of fears and not allowing them to dictate to what happens to us right here and right now. So you might be troubled. But the confidence that we find in the word of the Lord is you will not be distressed. You might be perplexed but you will never be in despair. You might be persecuted, but you will never be forsaken. You might be cast down right now, but you will never be destroyed. So my hope and prayer is that you find encouragement from this word. It's a short and sweet message, but it's a powerfully packed one. May we never be like that parakeet where we're just sitting, not singing life song because we are down and out. But may God give you a renewed sense of energy, a renewed sense of perspective from life after trusting him after handing your life over to him so may you have a, uh, an amazing week may you have a wonderful rest of your sabbath day and always find confidence in the fact that you can trust your god you can find confidence in his word you can find confidence in his faithfulness and you can truly find confidence in the fact that he will attend to every need so be blessed have a wonderful day amen let us bow our heads as we pray our god and our father we come before the throne of grace with thankfulness and grateful hearts, O oh Lord. Thank you for such a wonderful exposition of your word. Thank you for using your men servant, Pastor Otto, to speak to your children, O oh Lord. May the words that have fallen to us this afternoon not only change us, O oh Lord, and convict us, but they make us to be receptive of more of your words, O oh Lord. And may you bless your fami the families that have been listening to this message and the families that will continue to listen to this me message. And when you bless them, O oh Lord, do not forget your man servant in this family. Bless him and his ministry in a very special way. We pray all of these things not because of worthy, but because of Jesus Christ. Amen. We try to take